Hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Bikini and the Brain podcast. My name is Ashley Kaltwasser and to my left here is Adam Bonia from TeamElitePhysique.com. So, hey. hey. Good to have you guys back. How are you feeling, Adam? I feel rested and I feel ready for the podcast today. You're exceptionally chipper. I had a lot of I usually don't, you know, I don't sleep as bad as you, but I had... I usually go to bed like one or two and then I wake up at eight and I'm usually fine. But I went to bed at like 10 o'clock last night and I got all my check-ins done this morning before a podcast. I mean, this is a productive Adam today. Heck yeah. I'm happy. I'm happy with it. (laughs) It's nice to get it out of the way. Well, we hope you guys are doing well and we appreciate you listening in today. And uh, yeah, the season has officially started in full swing. You know, we had shows trickling in there in the beginning of the year, but now shows are happening every weekend so let's get this party started the 2023 competition season in full force yes we're both we both have the energy of the season and it's so funny to watch this year over year the energy of the season's here we're like yes let's go and then towards the end of the year we're like it's a lot of shows (laughs) it's been a lot of shows so yeah I'm, i'm super excited to be seeing them now everyone's coming out everyone's just starting to see pictures it's just it's a fun time it is fun march is good march is a good time yes yes So, as the season is starting and shows are happening, there's a lot of girls that are now transitioning from that off-season to in-season. And I think what a lot of people struggle with is, am I ready? That's what everyone's wondering. Am I ready? So, when a competitor takes that off-season, you know, they're going to put on a little body fat. They've been working hard. But, you know, putting on a little body fat, not intentionally, but... Well, for us, we don't intentionally put on body fat, but, you know, <laughs> it happens because uh, no one can say stage lean, right? So we have a lot of competitors now that are wondering, hey, I took the time off. I was working hard in the gym, but am I ready? It's hard to tell sometimes. Yeah, I think that's the that's a really important thing, especially when you're new. When you're in that first few years of competing, the when, like the... Here's the thing, you're always going to, until you step on stage, and I always tell people this, when should you compete is a really hard question to answer because there's always getting better, so there's always an argument for waiting longer unless the first time you step on stage you're just that girl who took so long you basically should be competing at the Olympia already, which is basically no one. You know, like no one does it. It's so rare where someone does her first show, wins, wins her first national qualifier, wins her first pro show, and then like does something at the Olympia. It's like almost unheard of. So the question becomes, when am I, when should I compete knowing that I'm not at that level yet, right? Mm -hmm. Because really the argument could be, I should just wait till I'm that good and just, you know, go through all the phases super fast. But no one really does that. And then you miss out on the experience and the motivation of getting on stage, knowing that you're still going to have some things to work on. So when is the right time to pull the trigger, I think is a really tough question to answer because there's always getting better you know there's always getting improved but then what are you going to do wait till you're absolutely perfect right so it's, right. it's a hard one to, to actually answer and i think this is fun a fun podcast to go into for that because we can kind of figure out okay, what does it make sense for you to compete you know absolutely and as i previously mentioned it can be difficult to see like the improvements that somebody has made because you know during that long off season maybe they put on a little body fat and you always like to i, I think it's so you say something like unveiling the curtain, yeah, right? Yeah, pull back the curtain. Pulling back the curtain, <laughs> right? So you're kind of hiding under a little curtain of fluff, hopefully not too much. If you listen to our podcast, you know, we don't believe in those uh, really fluffy off seasons, but everyone will have a little layer of fluff. So it can be really difficult to be like, okay, is this fat or is this muscle? I have to improve this body part, but I don't know. If it's fat, is it muscle? Hard to tell. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, too, especially with now there being more divisions, the wellness division being the the most complicated one I think people are having struggles with. And if you're, let's say you're building for wellness, which, you know, there's a lot of people that are building from bikini to wellness now, and you think, hey, I'm ready for wellness, but you just happen to store more body fat on your legs, that could be a very big surprise for people. So I always say, you know, pull back the curtain, you know, maybe go through a show, I think that that's a good thing to do is pulling back the curtain fully, you know, getting fully lean. And that's why I tell people, um, some of my athletes too, is that, you know, yeah, you're not going to be ready maybe for nationals yet, but why not pull back the curtain and see where everything looks like at this point, since you've been building for six months, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we could pull it back, 
we can see now we can see what your tie-ins look like now we can see what your you know what your your depth looks like what the insertions look like what it would you look like when you're fully lean and then we can really pick apart where to make the improvements at so yeah i think that's a good thing but especially for wellness girls who think that now their legs are fully built out and then they start dieting down like oh actually they still look like bikini legs you know so that's an important one i think to go through um i you know i don't know when the time will be right for you but you know just it, it keeps your body fat in check too mm-hmm. so yeah definitely so question adam now this is going to be different for everyone but usually uh what does a typical off season uh, look like in in terms of length like i know you know that's going to vary depending on like does this person have close to enough muscle is this person like a newbie uh, you know, competitor that needs to put on that muscle first, um, which by the way, I think that's a big mistake people make is they get so anxious and they want, they see their, their, um, first bikini competition. They want to jump into it right away and maybe they don't have that muscle base and they just go right into dieting, you know? And I think that's has to be said. It's definitely a mistake. We, you know, see a lot is like they just go right into dieting without building muscle first because they're, you know, a newbie. So I always say like, you know, you might be an athletic person or an active person, but training for physique sports is different than doing yoga four times a week. (laughs) You know, it's different. It's, it's a lot different. So I think that is a a mistake, but going back to the question, what is a typical length of an off season for someone to see the results that they want? Yeah. So that's a good question and a tough one, but I think you're on the right track of the newer you are, the longer the off season really is going to be, Yeah, you know? And so, um, for example, I had a check in this morning and I have a, I have an athlete. She's been prepping for a while. She's been working out for years. Um, I forget how old she is, but she's around my age. She's like 40 ish and she's working out for years. So at this stage, we can't really expect for her to gain that much more muscle. You know, she's a natural athlete too. So it's just, she's really close to her natural limit of how much muscle she can build. And she's a bit out from, you know, master's national still, but I'm like, you know what? Let's just start cutting now, even though she's probably leaner than she needs to be to start cutting now, because it's like, what am I going to do? Wait a month and gain an eighth of a pound of muscle. I mean, it's probably going to be like a 12th of a pound of muscle. Like, what am I really going to risk just getting to nationals on time and with her prep Versus just having some room when we're going to, you know, gain, you know, a gram of muscle. <laughs> you know, it's just, It doesn't make sense, you know, at a certain point for her to just continue to try to gain and gain and get as close to that window and have a hard cut. You know, so in that scenario for her, yeah, start cutting a little bit early because you're not really giving up that much. You know, it's a, a good example would be, you know, you, you know, you've been working out a long time. If you want to do more shows, you're not really giving up that much muscle because of your workout experience, right? You're not giving up a ton. It's not like, oh, I'm working out. I'm going to do another show and I'm going to lose the ability to build five pounds of muscle. You're not going to build five pounds of muscle this year. You know, it's just not going to happen. So it's just the way, you know, that's, that's one thing. But on the newer end of things, if you just started working out and you just went from, let's say sports, or you're going from, you know, let's like what you're talking about yoga to bikini competing, you are going to probably give up five pounds of muscle if you diet super, super hard and you're not able to really um, give it your all in the gym. Cause you're going at this, one of these real aggressive preps, you are going to be sacrificing some of that in very important window of your optimal growth period. You know, those first three years of growing that those newbie gains that you could be making. So in the scenario of someone in their first year, I would say do, I would, I would wait a year probably for yeah. most people in bikini these days with how much muscle they have, I'd probably wait a year, fully get them built out, round them out, get them where they need to be. Still do their check-ins, all that. And then Um, At the end of that year, do a cluster of shows within like a two, three month period, and then probably wait another, you know, 10 months to a year to get them back on stage and be improved and probably repeat that for, you know, depending on their genetics, two years to three years. And then after that, start really going after shows and targeting shows because they should be pretty close to where they need to be at that two, three year marker now for being competitive for a pro card Mm -hmm. with even average genetics. You know, you should be close to that if you're doing everything right. And you're not, you know, going crazy in the off season and you're not dieting down and losing all your muscle and things like that. You should be very close to it at that point. Mm-hmm. So that would be kind of my rule of thumb. Um, your workout age would have to a lot to do with it, your workout age. So um, and also the thing about workout age, too, I think that people get now that this is becoming more of a hot topic. We are talking about workout age is becoming more of a conversation. I'm hearing people just bring it up in normal conversation now to me. Like it's like, it's like a, an absolute scientific thing. I'm like, I just made it up. I got do you want to 
tell the audience just to clarify what it is in case they are not savvy on this? Yeah. So workout age has nothing to do with your actual age. It has to do with how long you've been working out. So I'm 40. I've been working out since I was 12 or 13. So I've had a 27 year workout age. So my 27th year of working out, um, there's two benefits and there's, there's some negatives too. The negatives are, I'm not going to all of a sudden just build a ton of muscle. Um, that, that period is done for me, right? I've done everything at certain points perfectly. I've reached my natural limit of how much I can have, of how much muscle I can have. But also the benefit is I don't really lose muscle either. It's kind of nice. I, <laughs> like, you know, I used to, you, we've been together long enough. You've seen, I was like hyper obsessed. If I didn't work out, I'd be like, oh, I can't get my workout. I'd be in a bad mood. Now I just, I'm like, you know, I'm boxing a lot. So if I don't feel like the energy is there, I, you know, might work out four times a week. I haven't lost anything. I'm actually having a hard time losing weight. Like, actual muscle weight because I have to weigh a little bit less. Uh-huh. And so, um, yeah, it just like doesn't leave. Right. So it's, it's kind of nice because I grew up like this skinny kid, but you can just build it up for so long. It just kind of stays around and it's super easy to, to keep it, keep it back. So there's the benefit, but the negative is, you know, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, grow 20 pounds of muscle in the next, in the next month either. So that's the workout age. The, the longer you do it, the more experience you have, you have those benefits. You do run into, you run into that window. Um, if you have a young workout age or in your first year or so, you can put on a, a lot of muscle. I mean, you can put on so much muscle in your first year of, of working out. So um, they basically, if you're a, just, these are, these are really rough numbers. I'll give you some estimates and it's really based on, you know, obviously if you're 5'10 and medium build versus five foot and small build, these numbers won't be anywhere near the same. But as a rule of thumb, female working out perfectly her first year, first year of working out touching weights. 10 pounds of skeletal muscle, very realistic in that first year if she's doing everything right. After that, about six pounds. After that, about half that, three to four pounds. And after that, it's about that, that kind of repeats two to three to four every year after that kind of thing. So it's, you know, you're fighting for grams of muscle at a certain, at a certain point. And so um, that's the workout age. So if you're anywhere in that young workout age, and not just young workout age, but another thing is in perfect execution of that workout age is another thing. So that's one thing if you, you have to maximize that window. So if you've never maximized that window, let's say you did your first year of working out, your first two years working out and you're like, oh, that sucks. I'm listening to Adam and I'm in now three years. But if all three years you haven't really been working out like, you know, right or haven't been eating the right foods to accommodate the muscle growth or not doing the right training splits, you still might have those, that growth available to you and it's kind of stocked up. And now it's time to cash out that interest <laughs> and, and really take advantage of and do things perfectly. And that's why you'll see sometimes, you know, cause people, you know, when you're in the limelight, like, the, like I'm in the fitness limelight in our, in our sector. Right. And they'll be like, man, that girl, she made some crazy gains. I'm sure she's all, you know, juiced up or whatever. Adam's got her. I'm like, no, dude, she just has never done anything right. <laughs> and she came to me, she did everything right. And all of a sudden she made this huge change. And that's, that's what happened. Like she just responded to, you know, crazy that it happened. She is genetically gifted and she just didn't even know it. I didn't know it, but she did everything right. And just boom, it happens, right? It's these crazy things happen. So, you know, it's one of those scenarios where she should have been probably getting those results the whole time, but she just wasn't doing everything right. right. So, um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. And um, actually, I really like that you brought this. This is cool because it dives into so many different areas of Definitely. this stuff, right? right? So, yeah, so that's the workout age and that's how you can look at your seasons. And I do think that the biggest error people make that I, that I run into is getting on stage when they're not ready or don't have enough muscle built yet because right. they're, they're anxious about getting on it and they want to get on stage. And, um, and, and not in, not in just the muscle building way, but in the fat loss way too. Right. You know, and I'm sure you, you know, um, every, every coach is going to run into that eventually too, where their client's just not ready. You know, they're just, they, they might've messed up on their diet. Um, maybe they just didn't respond right. Maybe something was off hormonally. Um, you know, we had the thyroid issue with you years ago. You weren't responding the way we thought that you would. I was at 134 for months. That was, too, that and was at, rough. And this was before Adam knew me that well. And I think in the back of his mind, he was probably thinking, is she eating pizzas every day? <laughs> that was <laughs> a like, rough I'm one. I'm not. I promise. I, remember, I, remember I, t- I was telling her, I was like, yours was the last check-in of the day. And I would like have Tori out of the office at that point. And I was... I was like, just let me look at this because this is my most stressful check. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't get her to move on this damn scale. Like, I just couldn't get it to work. So funny. And then, uh, yeah. So things, things happen to the best of them, you know. And so, uh, another one thing is, I'll say, don't overcommit yourself if you're a, an athlete too. Um, you know, if you have, if you have thirty pounds to lose, be realistic. You know, maybe you're not going to make your timeline. 
um, you know, it's, it's hard to lose 30 pounds. You know, it's hard to lose 20 pounds. So, you know, don't overcommit yourself. Don't book all your hair, your makeup, your tan, your show, your everything, your flight, all this. And then you're, you're just committing. You're like, oh, I already spent the money. Why? <laughs> it wouldn't have been any different if you did it three weeks before versus, you know, f- you know, uh, six months before. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. So besides the flight, really, you know, mm-hmm. so, so yeah. So I would say too, is like, especially if you've never competed before, allow yourself extra time because you, when starting, like, let's say you do have the muscle or whatever, it's, it's the fat loss you struggle with, but, um, it's your first prep. You don't know. Um, you never know how your body's going to react when it starts prepping, you know, especially your first time you could be in a position where your metabolism is a lot faster than you thought it could be slower you know, so on paper, it's like, ideally, you'd want to, like, lose a pound a week, and you can just plan it out like that and have all your math correct, but you don't know how your body's going to cooperate, just like you said. So, allowing yourself extra time is always a good idea, and just know that, in, especially in bikini, shows are happening all the time everywhere, so the stage isn't going anywhere, okay? So, don't rush into things. It's better to be patient and to be more ready and confident, and uh, it also gives you a chance to kind of gain more knowledge with with your body and the sport itself yeah Mm -hmm. enjoy it you know and enjoy the time because especially in the beginning and i run into this with you know not all pros but some pros i'll run into this and they they say that same thing they're like well it's so much different as a pro it was as an amateur as an amateur i had so much fun i was just like enjoying it with my friends and i was backstage with all the girls and it's just like it was so much fun and and as I stepped up in competition, it became so competitive, like nationals and then pro and then everyone wants to go to the Olympia. And don't get me wrong, backstage, the the pros, there's a lot of pros who are just, they're still doing the same thing. They're having a ton of fun. They're not taking it at too seriously, even though it's super serious, they're not taking it too seriously backstage, they're having fun. Um, some people can do that and some people can't when they get to that pro level. It's like laser focus and it has to be. So enjoy the time that you have like on your journey going through it and and don't think of it like think of it seriously, take it seriously, but also have the fun because the fun when you're at that, when the pressure, it's just a pressureless situation when you're in a, an amateur and NPC show, like take your time, have fun with it. You know, do a few shows. Don't just rush things and try to get to nationals and rush and rush and rush and rush, mm-hmm. you know, like have fun, enjoy the journey, you know? So. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself, you know, take your time. Um, okay. So let's go into a little bit about, um, the physical aspects of the off season and when you know you're ready. So um, I think something you need to ask yourself is, did you put on the proper amount of muscle needed during the off season going into prep? Because uh, something you guys need to also keep in mind is as you lose body fat, inevitably you're going to lose some muscle too. You know, it happens. In a perfect world, it would just yeah. stay put and you can just diet. And the only thing that gets diminished is the body fat. Unfortunately, you're also going to lose a little bit of muscle too. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Yeah. So as a rule of thumb, it's now as a rule of thumb, it's a shocking number of loss of lean mass versus loss of body fat. Okay. So as a coach and um, who's super researched, about one fifth the amount of weight that you lose will be from lean mass. Okay, That's so, so 20 twenty percent, right? So, so sad. for every pound, if you shoot and you hit twenty percent, you're doing pretty damn good. You're doing a really good job. Now, remember, I'm saying lean mass, not skeletal muscle tissue. Okay, because um, there's a lot of things. Anything that's not fat is considered lean mass. Okay, because it's not fat mass, right? So we're talking bone is considered lean mass, right? Anything that's not fat mass is lean mass. So when you see that number, you're like, whoa. And that's how I first saw it when I was younger. I was like, dude, 20%. That's what I'm shooting for. I don't even want to lose any body fat. Like I really just keep the 20%, right? And that was like in a good scenario. Some, it could get as high as 50%. You know, that's when you're really losing muscle. These are the girls that are doing, this is where it goes again. You know, we keep talking about the two hour girls, the, the 800 calorie girls, the two hour girls, they're the ones reaching that 50%. So that's when the argument again comes in. And when people are like, you know, you got to gain body fat, Adam. I don't know why you keep saying you can't gain body fat in the off season. And I'm like, I'm not saying you can't gain any. I'm saying you shouldn't gain so much where you have to diet like that. And then you purposely, well, it, you can't, you can't avoid losing more lean mass, which actually dives into a higher percentage of skeletal muscle at that rate of doing so much. Cause your body's just trying to maintain itself at that point. You know, you're in a 
really low calories, you're at really high activity level, um, you're at an extreme deficit, and your body's just trying to survive. And yeah, of course, it's going to get, when your body's trying to survive, it's going to get rid of things that are not efficient. It's not efficient to carry around all that muscle and to feed it oxygen all day long. It's not, even, you know, to, to feed it nutrients all day long. It's not an efficient way to live. The body, what we're trying to do to the body is completely counterintuitive to what the body wants to do. The body wants to maintain life, right? Just trying to keep you alive. It's all it's trying to do. So having energy stores saved up, having fat saved up, having as low of energy use as possible is the perfect scenario for the body. Us being, you know, fat with no muscle would be a great survival tool for the body in terms of, you know, not thinking of heart things or anything like that, but that would be, you know, ton of energy storage and no energy expenditure. This is great, right? That's where the body wants to be. You're doing the exact opposite to the body. So you're trying to get, be as least efficient as possible by having as much muscle as possible. Use as many calories as you can throughout the day with having as low of energy storage as possible. It's like, you know, you're telling your body, okay, hey, I'm not going to drive a fuel efficient vehicle. I'm going to drive a big diesel truck and I'm just going to drive all the way to Florida from Las Vegas and try to not stop for gas. Like you're, the truck's not going to work. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's not how it works. You know, the, the truck needs a ton of gas. It needs a ton of energy storage, right? It needs that. And you probably, you know, you're, if you want to get to Florida, you probably shouldn't be driving. You probably, it's probably the best idea to drive a diesel. You're going to stop for like, stop for gas a lot more often than you would if you were driving a, a hybrid of some type, right? A, a Prius. So that's what the body wants to be, right? The Prius and you want to be the diesel. <laughs> so, so getting to Florida, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to be very smart and methodical on how you get there, right? So that's the, that's the scenario that, that you're in now. That's just my off season rant part of it, which is day, episode every episode. It's like it's like a religion at this point. But but the the thing we have to think about is okay, skeletal muscle out of that twenty percent, you want to minimize that as much as you can, and you also do that by having uh, maintaining your workout intensity. You know, if your calories are really really low, you're not going to maintain that workout intensity. And if you're saying that you are, you're lying. There's you're not. It's just not possible to to have the best workouts with, you know, reaching PRs and at least maintaining your strength with eating 800 calories and doing two hours of cardio. So yes, you're going to lose more muscle in that scenario because of the workout, just the workout intensity just isn't there. It can't be there. Right. So that's a, that's another thing too. Um, so yeah, there's my, there's my rant on that, but yeah, there's a couple, there's a, a lot of factors. So your skeletal muscle, let's say it's probably, um, actual skeletal tissue that you're losing in that, out of that, that one pound of weight loss is probably in that eight to 10% range. So it's a very little amount and I, the, the exchange is worth it, but try to make that exchange as worth it as possible. And you do that by keeping your calories as high as you can, keeping your cardio as low as you can while still making the weekly target prog progress and while still maintaining your workout intensity, which is never worth sacrificing. So um, as you were talking about the um, weight loss, isn't all fat, it's some of its muscles, some of its non-skeletal muscle. Um, but it goes into the question, like, how can you tell what's what? How can you tell what you're losing isn't muscle or or water? Is there yeah. a way? Or I guess on the flip side of it, what underneath the curtain, how can you tell what is water, what is muscle before you start cutting? Yeah, that's if a, that makes sense. Did I word that correctly? Yeah, okay. and that's a, you know it it goes into another direction of what we need to be looking at too and what the, the fears that we need to eliminate as well. One of the biggest fears that people run into is losing muscle with doing these, um, doing these preps. And I think it's a realistic fear. I think people should have a fear, a healthy fear of it, right? Because you don't want to just diet down and lose all this muscle. But one of the things that people really will see when they're first start dieting is that overall fullness of the muscle it leaves, you know, and when the fullness leaves, you, you look smaller, you feel softer, you're squishier. And that's just a natural part of losing body fat and being carbohydrate and glycogen depleted. So that's something that people need to pay attention to and understand that it's just part of the process. Some people, for some reason, can stay fuller than others while they're in prep. Now understand when you're, so your, your muscles have all these um, you have a lot of glycogen stored in your muscles. So you have carbohydrates, you consume them, they become glucose, glucose stores, and when it's stored, it's called glycogen. So it's basically carbohydrates stored in the muscle. Okay, so that's basically what it is. So when you're having an abundance of calories, your energy's good, you're not doing much cardio, you're in your off-season, you're lifting hard, you're getting good pumps, you know, the carbs are being shoved into the muscles while, while you're working out, 
and you're, you know, your your glycogen super loaded. You're at your maximum ability of storing glycogen. Um, yeah, you're rounder, you're harder, you're more full. Now, you know, you you can't maintain that while not eating a ton of carbohydrates, while moving more than you're consuming calorie wise. And that's the whole point of dieting, is right? You're consuming um, less than you're than you're moving. That's the that's the whole way you diet. So. Yeah, your body is going to take those carbs from the muscle cell, the glycogen from the muscle cell, use them as energy. It's not going to replenish them because it doesn't have them available to replenish. And so you start getting smaller like right away. And so people, especially in the bodybuilding world, they'll see this and they'll be like, I'm losing size, I'm losing size, I'm, I don't have the fullness, no, 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 right? Of course you don't have the fullness. You're not supposed to be fullness right now, right? It's just part of it. So that's something that's, it takes a while to understand that because it's a big difference really quickly. So does it mean you necessarily lost skeletal muscle? Um, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but do understand you're not going to be able to keep that fullness throughout prep. So when people write me and they're like, oh, I'm just getting flat, I'm getting flat. I'm like, yeah, of course you're getting flat. You're, you're eight weeks in a dieting. How would you not be getting flat, you know? So um, that's something that you're going to have to be aware of, especially for low-carb dieters and like, let's say, keto dieters. You guys feel it the most right away. So the so that's that's one thing. It's going to be impossible to decipher until you're, fully lean and fully loaded back up with carbs. What I will say too, is that when you're at your smallest and your leanest, that's when people think you're the biggest, you know, you think you're the smallest because you, you feel, I mean, I've been there, you know, like when I'm shredded, shredded lean and I'm like 20 pounds under my current weight, I feel like, like I'm embarrassed how small I'd get. I'd be like embarrassed. I'd be like, gosh, I feel so little right now, you know? And then I'd get to the gym and then people were like, man, you, you've been hitting hard lately. You've been working out hard. You look big. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm down like 20 pounds. <laughs> like that's when you get the most confidence is when you're the small. So don't, it's just a, it's just a mind thing. Um, you lose an incredible amount of weight when you're in show prep and people don't get it because they don't usually, some of them never even weighed that in their entire life. Right. And they're like, well, why, I, I have to get down how low? You're like, don't worry. It's just temporary. But you're not losing that much muscle that easy. If you're maintaining your workouts, you're not maintaining, you're not losing that much of skeletal actual muscle. But fullness, glycogen reloading, all that and how you're going to look, that does go away really quickly. And it comes back at the end um, if you're filled out right. And I understand too, another thing that we don't talk about too much is, is how much fullness should you have and how full should you be? Well, you know, it's very rare you're shooting for 100% fullness for someone. Unless they're shredded lean and they're overly lean, you really don't shoot for 100% fullness. And if you are, usually they're spilling over and they're not looking that hard. They're looking softer and usually sacrificing some conditioning for it. So it's like the goal is, you know, even at the end is like 90% full, you know? Um, unless they're someone who came in really, really lean that week before, then you can overfill them called fill and spill if they get that lean. But I mean, how many times a year do we get to fill and spill? Like once, twice, maybe rare. Yeah. It's super rare. rare. So it's like, that's the best scenario. Like get someone lean too lean. And I'm like, okay, fill and spill, baby, let's go. It's like the, cause you know, for sure they're going to be hundred percent full, but they know you're going to be spilled over, but it's okay. You can afford it cause they're so lean. So usually it's like 90% fullness, sometimes even like eighties if they're really muscular, you know? So there's a whole science to that, the whole thing, but losing skeletal muscle, um, not the, so I would, I would guess I would say we'd have to put it in, like if we're put on a chart, we'd have to say avoidable loss of skeletal muscle is very low. Mm -hmm. Avoidable loss, right? Um, there's unavoidable loss of skeletal muscle from dieting, period. Like that's going to happen, but the extra is what we're trying to avoid, right? And that's from the hard workouts, from not going too low in cardio, uh, calories, not going too high in cardio you're doing those things, you should be at that minimum marker, which is going to be pretty low. Mm -hmm. And uh, true or false, Coach Adam, uh, the faster you uh, get lean or go into an extreme deficit, the more muscle you'll lose. Or if you do it slow and steady, you get to preserve more muscle. Yeah. You know what? Um, there's been a couple of uh, studies done on this. And actually what's shown is that skeletal muscle, which you wouldn't you wouldn't think, I didn't think, but it, it's actually been shown a couple times. Now, there's a lot of things that variables that go into all these studies, but um, the, the only research that I've seen on it has been short and fast has been more preservation of everything. Oh, so that's something Isn't that that's crazy? interesting because I think like, you know, that has been kind of the, the idea for a long time. Um, but just like we're finding out with a lot of things in the past that bodybuilders used to do, um, it doesn't necessarily translate like you think it does, you know? Just like whenever everyone was doing six meals a day every three hours or you're yeah. going to lose muscle and just speed up your 
metabolism. We kind of like laugh at that now, but that was very serious uh, thing, you know, like 10 years ago, everyone was doing it. So that's interesting now that we're, you know, coming across that, that new research that uh, kind of disproves that myth, you know, because that was a very widely accepted idea, like slow and steady. You don't want to do it too fast. You're going to lose all your muscle. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So it was short and yeah, short and fast. So that was the key. Short it was short, fast. aggressive, fast. That yes. was the key. Um, and there's even a study that even goes farther than the bodybuilding, like losing body fat period of, you know, four weeks, eight weeks. One was done in two weeks with, and they tested metabolism and mu skeletal muscle loss. Um, of the effect of extreme diets in short periods, like very short periods of two weeks. And they basically did one gram per pound of lean mass of protein. And that was like it. That's all the food they ate. So for you, it'd be like 120 grams of protein a day. And uh, I think they did some veggies and stuff, but that was it. So 120 grams of protein for you would be 480 calories, right? That's the study. It's crazy. I mean, imagine that 480 calories a day for two Yikes. weeks. Yeah. And then they did, um, you know, they exercised in cardio and, they wanted to just test metabolism before, test it after, uh, but they had the best effect of fat loss, of course, because they're not eating anything, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they had very, almost almost no effect on metabolism in that short period, of, in that short window, and almost no effect on skeletal muscle loss in that short window, which is crazy to think about. So there's even, you know, farther we can go with it than, than people think. So how you, another thing is how you methodically get to that stage is important too. Now, the the real issue becomes when you like look at that diet and you look at that science like intuitively you would say okay so why am I dieting for 16 weeks 20 weeks I should diet only for four to eight and then go hard and then have the least effect metabolically and the most effect fat loss wise um, and maintain the most skeletal muscle yeah if you could like have a crystal ball and say hey every one of these whatever six weeks you're going to diet for is going to work exactly as we need it to that would be the superior method but that's so hard to do you know it, I have, I have people that have had to lose eight pounds in my career for a show, like a 120 pound competitor who needed to lose eight pounds to get ready for a show. And intuitively I'm like, okay, one pound a week, we need eight weeks. So I'll do nine week prep. And with those eight weeks, the ninth week won't count because it's peak week and eight weeks will lose one pound a week. And then all of a sudden you're three weeks in no, no weight loss. Right. How does that make sense? Right. Everything was perfect. Diet was perfect. Off season was perfect. Calories were high. Cardio was low. Everything was ready. Setup was perfect. And you're like, okay, why isn't this working? This doesn't make any sense, right? So you can't, you can't depend on it. So it's over, you do want to over-prepare. And if everything works perfect, yeah, you can get some reload meals in there, do a diet break on a, on a, a week in the prep. So I'm still a fan of, of longer preps with having options than just coming to that finish line. Because it's, you know, I mean, how many, you've done this for so long, how many of your weeks do you make no progress even now? You know, it, it happens. It's just- Yeah, and the closer you get to show, I mean, well, at my point- you're not going to see pounds lost because I'm already close. I usually stay pretty yeah. close. But, yeah, I agree because you never know what's going to happen with the body. You can be sick and that sets you back a week. You could uh, – anything. Just life happens. Sometimes the body doesn't want to cooperate. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely a fan of the uh, allowing yourself extra cushion weeks yeah. just in case things don't move uh, like, you know, like you think they will. So another thing to uh, be mindful of before starting your contest prep is, and you touched on it a little bit, make sure you're in a good spot hormonally and uh, you're healthy. You know, you don't want to go into a prep and you're already sick, right? And same thing with injuries. Do you have any nagging injuries? They don't, maybe they don't seem like anything uh, significant right now, but if you start running on that foot, you know, five times a week or whatever the case may be, is this going to be an issue? You want to make sure you're a hundred percent healthy, injury-free, fresh before you even start that prep, because it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Only going to get worse. I agree. I a hundred percent with that. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people want to tough through and it's tough through something. And I'm like, well, even if you get there, which, you know, you'll probably get there, but you're not going to be your best. You know, you're, you're, there's going to be something off, you know, so just, to, just pull back, you know, there's, there's basically two shows a year in the entire world where I'll say, don't do that too. And that would be the Olympia and the Arnold and kind of, you know, tough it out, you know, do what you got to do, tough it out. After that, like just pull off any show, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense to try to be, cause you're not in today's world, 
even at the NPC level, you, you have to be 100%. It's just it, the competition level is so stepped up from a decade ago. You know, a decade ago, I could have a girl at 90%. At 90%, I can kind of take her through a few shows, and I would kind of, like, peek her up. I, would, I actually used to do that, and it would work quite well. I would do, like a, like, a girl wanted to compete, let's say, six times. And I was like, all right, that's cool. We started off at, like, her first show, she's at, like, 90%, then 95%, then 100%, 100%, then 95%, then 90%. She'd be finished off with her season, and, you know, and sometimes she'd do better at that 90% and 95%. Ten years ago, you know, they didn't, her being a little bit soft was okay, you know. So, you know, you could usually do pretty well with that type of thing. But now it's, like, 100%, 100%, 100%. <laughs> I mean, you can't even be, like, 98% on, like, a pro stage. You've got to be 100%. So the... The, the, it's just if you're fighting an injury, a knee injury, whatever, you're and you can't give it your all. Like just hang it up, let that injury heal. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's only going to make it really tough for you, and it's just not worth it, really. Like I always say, there, there's many shows. They're not going anywhere, so just be patient. Um, so moving on, let's talk about the mental aspects. Is your head in the game? Like, are you mentally ready to give it your all? Because I will say this, if you're already starting prep and you're not motivated and you already think it's a chore on day one, you're not ready. You are not yeah. ready. You should be hungry for this. Not hungry with food, but like hungry to prep. You should be like, oh, I cannot wait to prep. I cannot wait to do cardio. I cannot wait to be in a deficit. Woo, fun stuff, you know, because that it's only going to, it's only going to get worse again. Usually as you do start cutting the calories, it's going to be like, okay, it's tough. I'm hanging in there. But if you're not motivated off the, off the jump, there's, there's very, uh, very small chance you're going to find more motivation closer. It, you have to start off a hundred percent, like in it, your mind has to be in it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, there's, there's really nothing to say to that. The, the mental this game is, you know, the more you go into it, the farther you get into it, it's, I mean, honestly, it might even be more mental than it is physical, to be honest, like just pushing, because you got to get to the gym, you got to be motivated to give it your best in the gym, you can't just be going through the motions, you can't accept that 90% of being 90% of your diet is okay, because it's not, you know, you're not going to get, 90% of your diet isn't going to get you 100% of the results, it's not going to get you 90% of the results, you know, people think 90% will give me 90%, it's like no 90% gets you like 40% of the results, if any results that week, you know. And so I, I'll have girls that'll check in like that once in a while. Oh, it's 90% on diet. And I'm like, okay, so you weren't on diet. That's literally just say you weren't on diet. Because that, like, I don't know if you're trying to, like, give yourself a pat on the back that you were mostly on diet. You're either on diet or you're not on diet. There's no percentage of that adherence that equals a better end result, right? It's like, okay, so you're, if you get to the stage and you're 90% ready, are you going to be on stage? Like, no, you're not going to win. So, like, it doesn't make sense. You know, people give them them that, themselves that break. I was mostly on diet. I did pretty good, you know, and it's like, hey, we're playing a real sport here, you know, and it's, you can't go in and say, you know, I gave it my 90%, coach. Like, their coach is going to be like, why did you give me your 90%? Like, if you're on the hockey rink and I get off the rink and I'm like, hey, coach, I gave it my 90%. I don't know why that guy scored. He's like, you know, like, is that acceptable? He's like, no, if you aren't like diving, like risking injury, why are you even on my team? You know, that I'm going to get cut from the team. You know, so it's this, it, people, people don't take our sport as seriously because it's so like, on their own, right? It's so on their own. They're, they're not around the coach. They're not around the team. They're like, yeah, I'll just do my 90%. Like, guys, it doesn't work. You know, you talk to these top guys, like Ronnie Coleman. I always go back to that interview with Ronnie Coleman. And someone's like, you know, after he won, he, they were like, you know, how many times did you cheat on your diet, Ronnie? And he was like, what? How many times? You, now that you won, how many times did you actually go off your diet? He's like, I, he's like, I didn't even know how to answer that question. It was so crazy for me to even hear that question I was like, I was put off guard by the question, like, why would I do that? Like, why would I, I never even thought about going off my diet. That's how, that's the level of what it takes if you want to be the best. Now, if you just want to be casual, yeah, you're 90%, whatever, that's cool. It's transformation style. But in prep, it's like, it's an all or none thing. And you guys really do have to be ready for it. Yeah, and absolutely. I think, I think in the off season, it, happens, it, it needs to be that too. You know, I think that people think it's just a full break, but there's no breaks. There's no off season in, mm -hmm. in, in competition if you're trying to be, if you're trying to be your best. I am, and I don't want to come off the wrong way. I am all for the casual competitor. I think that the, the casual competitor, without the casual competitor, industry probably wouldn't exist. I think that it's awesome to be a casual competitor. I think that, um, you know, if I was going to be considered anything now, it would probably be considered like a casual competitor who just takes it kind of seriously. And that's cool. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at peace with that. I'm not giving it my all right now, but I'm not talking like I'm giving it my all. I'm like, 
oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do my best this year. And I'm like, but you spent eight months, like, really not even giving your 80%, you know? How do you expect to improve from that when everyone else is constantly giving 100% that really wants it, right? You got to be honest with yourself on these things. And if that mental part of it is something you really need to strengthen, just like any other muscle, it needs to be strengthened. You got to, one, start with not giving yourself excuses. You can't give in to those excuses in any high-level sport. You can't be like, oh, I gave it my 90%, and that's good enough. It's not good enough, right? You need to find a way to get to 100%. And we have to be honest with it, in the off season too, not just the in season, right? So yeah, free meals, all that stuff, it could be there. But everything else, if you're trying to be the best in the world, you, it's, it's not going to come easy. It's not going to come from just casually. Like you're going to just wake up one day and accidentally be there giving your 90%. Like, oh, well, it's so crazy. I was working out hard, like relatively hard most days, it's either between, between four and six days. And I ended up Miss Olympia. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know how that happened. Like, yeah, you're in a dream. You're in a dream. It's, you know, it's just like any other, any other thing in like the real world. Like, yeah, I kind of worked hard and I just ended up a billionaire. <laughs> like, no, that's not how it goes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's hard to go off on a tangent on that one, but that one really does get to me because I have, I see so many times where people will say they're hundred percent and I'm like, no, you're hundred percent when you're on plan. When you're in season, you're hundred percent, but, but your other stuff, it weighs into you being hundred percent on plan, you know? Yeah. So if you're 70% off season and you're hundred percent in season, your net average is like 85%. Okay, cool. You're at 85%. Get to a hundred, you know, mm -hmm. then you're going to be great. It's going to take great pulling greatness from within you to be great, to reach your full potential a hundred percent of the time. So it's an unfortunate thing because people don't get that, but this sport, it's daily and it's accumulative, you know, and it's just one of those things. There's just no off season. Yeah. So it's not, we need to get rid of the all or nothing mindset, you know, which all would be in season and nothing in the off season. Yeah. It's not an excuse to let yourself go, to slack off. Um, it's just going to make everything much harder. And you're also going to wonder, man, what if I was 100% in the off season? Yeah. Where would I be? What it could have should us? Got to eliminate as many what it could have should as you can in life because they don't feel very good. I hate what it could have should us. That's, uh, you know what, that's, there's this like mindset guy and he, he still, I, forgot, I'm, I've, uh, I haven't watched it in like a couple years, but I wish I, I got to find it. Maybe I have it saved on my YouTube. Um, and to keep himself motivated, he would go around to, um, I, I guess if you, what do they call it? Retirement homes, elderly homes, right? Places. And he would. Yeah, nursing homes. Okay. And then he would he would go around, he would just do interviews with these these guys, spend the day there, or whatever, and he would ask them, you know, questions about their life or anything like that. And he said the number one thing he always found at all of them was just regret at them. He said, and it felt so it was it was really sad because he's these guys would say they're at a point in their life where they really can't do anything about it at this point, because they're, you know, they're 70, 80 years old. They can't, you know, all of a sudden start training to be in the major league baseball or Miss Olympia, right? But all of them said, I wish I would have just tried, not all of them, but some of them were like, I wish, wish I would have tried a little bit harder at whatever. I wish I would have gave it a little bit more mile. And he said it was just so common that now he lives his life in a way where he can't not give 100%. Mm. He's, he just is in, in such utter fear of being the guy talking to himself, saying, I wish I would have tried harder. I wish to see what would have happened. That uh, it's like it puts a real fear into him. So he stays, he does it, and he's, you know, he's, he's visiting and giving back to the community at the same time. But um, he has some of the recordings like on YouTube somewhere. I got to find them. You could probably look it up. And he, yeah, he just, he asks, he, he goes to these people and then just, he says regret. And he's like, it's so scary to him now that, to, to have that regret. And I think there's a lot of people out there that need to hear that because there's so many girls out there I see with just awesome potential that could, their whole life can change, you know, if they just gave it their all for a couple years. Mm -hmm. But they're, and they're, they're kind of lying to themselves saying they are giving it enough when they really deep down know they're not. And I'm like, man, if you just, if you just, like, I could see you're structurally, you're there. I could see that your muscles grow. They don't fight you that much. You know, I could see that you lose body fat pretty well. Like everything's lined up besides your mindset, you know? And if you got, if you pull, were able to pull a hundred percent out of you, you would shock the world type of thing. And, and maybe that's you, you know, maybe that's you. And you're just going day by day saying that you're giving enough knowing that you're not. And it's just a sad thing um, because it, you know, I don't have the genetics to be that, to be Mr. Olympia, but if I did, I'd be, I'd be there hundred percent. I gave up on that when I got to the higher levels and I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not structurally like these guys are, <laughs> they grow so much faster I'm structurally. Like my waist isn't that small. Like I, I could see it, you know, but there's some, I'm like, man, you could be that good. It's crazy. I see it now. You could be that good. And, uh, they just don't apply it and it's sad, you know? So hopefully 
this will spark some motivation, some self-reflection on some people, and they'll say, you know, I don't want to be that girl who lives with regret. I want to give it my all, and let's just see, let's just see how far we can go. And the worst case scenario is you learn extreme discipline, and you pull out that that uh, that fire from within you, and you just pull out, just pull that out of you, you know. And you say, you know, I know that girl's in there, and I just need to pull her out. And it's a it's a pretty cool thing to see that, you know, when you pull that person out, and you're like, man, I didn't even know I could I had that lion in me, you know. And so um, I've seen it happen a few times, and maybe this will spark some girls, right, to, to get out there and, and pull that line out of them. Yeah, totally. And then another aspect of the mental, um, you know, wondering, is uh, your mental state ready for the prep? Is I would also, also ask yourself, what are your stress levels like, you know? Um, because you have to have a clear mind. You can be motivated. But if you're too stressed, you don't have a clear mind because you've got 50 million things going on, maybe something that is really heavy on your mind, maybe a recent death in the family or whatever, you just lost your job, anything. Stress is not going to make prep <laughs> much easier. Um, although I will say I, I have seen a few scenarios where like a girl would break up with their boyfriend and then have this insane motivation. So if you're able to kind of uh, use it as a stress relief, then go for it. But if you know you're one of those people that get affected by stress easily um, and not to your favor, then I would suggest, again, holding off before you start prepping. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, Tori always says, breakups make bodybuilders. Oh. <laughs> breakups make bodybuilders. It's funny. Yeah, uh, what, what is it about that? But it's a true, that's a true thing. It's one of the, one of the motivating things. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think you're 100% right on that. I mean, we talked about the stress before and how how much it affects the actual results. It doesn't really make sense on paper because on paper, everything's the same. Your cardio, your cardio output, your calorie intake, everything's the same. But when someone's stressed and someone's not, there's a big difference on their physique. Um, I have a client competing. I won't say her name because, you know, but she'll know who she is. I'll show you her after. It, her, she was like, my job's so stressful, my job's so stressful. She always kept telling me this. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, you, you know it. You see it as a coach. Like when someone's stressed, they don't make as much progress. And then she went on vacation to Mexico for two weeks. And, okay, she's, so she's in Mexico. She's not. She's still doing good because she's getting ready for a show. Like, but the show's like 18 weeks away at this point, right? So she's, you know, 90%, right? Which is what we just said not to do. She's 90% and she loses six pounds on vacation. I'm like, what in the hell is going on? Like, are you perfect on your diet right now? Because I even told her like, hey, enjoy it a little bit. Have a meal, have a free meal here and there. Um, and, and she just lost it. She's like, yeah, she's like, this just shows me how stressful my job is and, and probably also what it's doing to me outside of just my results, but like my life, like my, my health, my long-term health too. And I needed, I really do need to get out of this job. She was trying to get out of it for a while and like applying other way. She applied to another job, got another job. And this prep now has been, we've been together. I want to say, I want to say we're close to three years, probably maybe, maybe, maybe a little, maybe two, but her body's never responded this way. Like never responded, even close, like even 50% of this. It's so crazy to see just what the stress can do. And She's at a point now where she's getting ready for a show and she's ready ahead of time. And then that's never, we've never even been at 100% her full potential, but now she's ready ahead of time, which is crazy, right? So it's just the stress, whether we want to accept it or not, it does have a huge factor on your, on your results, you know? And unfortunately, a lot of times you can't control the stress, but it is a good point. If you're at like the highest stress point of your life, don't add competing as a stress yeah, to it. Yeah, it's just going to add more stress. <laughs> yeah. I mean, enjoy the off season, you know, keep your calories high and, and, and have fun in the gym, lifting heavy weights. Use that as your stress reliever, not your stress adder, because some people, prep can add stress, a lot of stress to some people because you're, every day you're looking at yourself in the mirror. I'm not going to be ready. I'm going to be ready. Oh, I'm looking flat. I'm looking. And you just, it's just probably not the right time. If you have no choice and you qualified for the Olympia, you know, get through it, do what you got to do. But remember, if you're if it's not that, like there's pretty much there's always going to be another show. You know? Absolutely. So let's talk a little about about the external factors that could uh, potentially be not ideal when starting a prep, such as um, maybe you're at a time in your life where you know you're self-employed, but you have a lot going on at that time. And it's hard to fit anything into that schedule, right? Maybe you have, it's, it's soccer season, you have a, a child and 
maybe you have to go here for this and there and this, and there's so much to do throughout the day that, you know, workout doesn't, isn't on the top of your list. Work time to work out. You might be able to squeeze in here and there, but it's not your best, right? Um, I would highly suggest finding a better time when you're not as busy um, to do that. Now, can you still do it? Yes. But is it ideal? No. You know, it's, home workouts are great, but they're probably not as intense as going to the gym. Um, but anything really, if it's, if it's something that's taking up a lot of your time, adding the, the prep factor in it is going to make it much more difficult. You have to weigh your food, you have to prepare, you have to go to the gym. And not only that is I, you know, keeping a very consistent schedule, I think is very important, you know, keeping that daily routine. And if there's something that's always going on and different things, and it's, it's hard, it's hard to prep, you know? And, um, also is like, do you have trips coming up with vacation? Do you have family reunions and a lot of travel that can also hinder your progress when prepping? So I would wait till your schedule's a little more clear um, to do that. Yeah, I think there's a there's a few factors that are going to go into that too. So I think that you're you're right on um, on pretty much all of that. And one of the things I think there'd be just a variable for a very small percentage of people is if you're if you're already very close to stage lean, maybe you're like five, eight pounds away and you're already super intense and everything's going good in the gym, your mindset's right, but you have a couple of trips or whatever going on, five to eight pounds, you probably get away with it in a six, in a 16 week prep type of thing. And, um, and also remember if you're, if you're set up right, so your calories are relatively high and your cardio is relatively low in the off season and you don't need to do too much to get prepped out, um, and you're already working out, let's say you're already working out for an hour and you're already doing 20 minutes of cardio. So really the difference for you is, okay, now I need to eat a little bit less, but my calories are already up and I need to, I'm probably going to end up doing 20 more minutes of cardio in that scenario probably makes sense for you. But if you're on, if you're past that point, I think that you're hundred percent right. Right. If you, which is a very few percentage of people like right. how, who's actually staying, you know, eight, 10 pounds and not doing that. Much. So yeah. So if you're, if you're that girl, yeah. You know, and that's, that's one of the things you see Ashley competing a lot when she travels a lot for shows and appearances and all these things, she gets, she has that luxury. Her calories are, you know, in a decent uh, spot in the off season, which her off season is kind of, you know, um, it's frequent, but minimal, I guess, if you want to call it that, like right now, technically she's an off season, right? Um, her cardio is relatively low. And then if we just need to lose, you know, five pounds, four pounds, whatever it is, we just flip it, right? Mm -hmm. Cardio goes up, calories go down, show prep back to it, right? That type of thing. So um, if you're that, if you're that person and you're that far uh, advanced, then that's one way of going about it. But, um, but yeah, so there, there's that too. But yeah, anything that's really coming up, like you're talking about, like family vacations always get in the way. Um, you know, a lot of these things get in the way. Right. So it's just be smart about it. Yeah. And I would say too, even using myself as an example, although I'm prepping throughout the year, uh, when I prep for like the Olympia, for example, I'm just like, I really try to eliminate as much travel as possible. Like I want to be home in my routine. And even at that point, I say, I don't want to take on any more clients during this time so that it kind of relieves my stress. So I don't have so much obligations to do throughout the day, but travel is a big thing. You know, I'm traveling all throughout the year for shows, but I'm also missing a lot of workouts when I'm doing that. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, it, it is difficult doing show to show scenarios and trying to stay full is because, you know, you're missing workouts and stuff just from the travel, the time zones, the jet lag. Um, but yeah, that's why when it's Olympia time, like probably like two months leading up to Olympia, I'm really trying to not travel if I don't have to, or at least just minimal travel and minimal obligations and appearances and stuff. Cause I want to have my routine that I do every day and just keep consistent with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and then another thing I would add, um, as far as an external factor that you need to be aware of before you start prepping is, are you financially prepared to prep? You know, um, because it, it costs money to compete shows, tans, registration fees, suit, hair, everything. It, it's a bit pricey, you know? And, if you're struggling, you know, paycheck to paycheck, I don't know if it's a good idea at that point to start prepping for a show that's that you can't afford, you know? There there's ways to make it a little cheaper, but it's still going to be an expense at the end of the day. Yeah. I will say though, 
one thing with the the financial part of it, uh, the NPC is the most cost effective um, competition uh, committee or, or a circuit, whatever you want to call it. So it is, uh, yeah, because there's there's some that are crazy expensive, but NPC is relatively relatively at a good spot. You know, uh, uh, entering a class at an NPC show is going to be around a hundred dollars. Your NPC card is going to be like what was it one twenty now, one forty? I don't know what it is right now. Um, so, you know, the rest of the stuff, it can, it, you know, suits, like there's ways of making it cheaper, but yeah, you're still, you're going to be in that, you know, around that thousand dollar marker, you know, for, for a show like them at a very cost effective route. So, um, yeah, to take into account, but I, I do like that about the NPC, you know, it's, yes. it's one of the more cost effective ones versus a lot of the other ones that I see out there getting to the thousands, like multi thousands. Which oh is crazy. yeah. And yeah. there's shows all over the States. Yeah. Like, so, um, having more shows eliminates that travel, uh, but possibly the travel expense. Like you don't have to fly, fly to the other side of the USA just to compete or whatever. It's like, I bet you, you can find one that's close, pretty close to your home at yeah. some point, unless you live like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but for the most part, you can find one close. Yeah. And what's, what's cool now is these days, you know, a years ago, it was not a, it was not a thing where girls were doing their own hair and makeup. And now they're, a lot of them are doing their own hair and makeup. You know, you're, I think you're a big part of that too, because you do your own makeup oh, and I mean, videos give me and stuff. too much credit, but well, yes, I, I like doing my own hair and makeup. A lot of people really didn't think that it was just not really a thought, you know, now even like on our team, we get a lot of girls that are just trying to do it now, but before it wasn't a thought or a goal to be able to do that. It was just part of it. It was just like, Oh, I got to do my own. I got to pay for makeup. I got to pay for hair. It was never really a thought that I could do it, you know? And now that people are doing it, um, it's becoming more and more. I think just because the stress of it and the just the, the cost of it is so expensive. You know, you, if you do hair and makeup at USA, it's like a two-day show. Like, you're like $500. It's uh, just, for me, it's a stress. And I like yeah. being in my own time. I can get it paid for through my sponsors, no problem. But even even with it being free, I still want to do it myself. Because yeah. I just like to be in control of my time frame and be like, you know, I'm, I'm in control. Like, yeah. that's the thing. I don't want to be like on somebody else's time and trying to get in a time slot. And if they're late, then I'm late, then I'm stressed. Yeah. It can be messy. So, yeah. and, I, and I'll say too, when, when women do their own hair and makeup, it's very rarely I've ran into an issue with their hair and makeup where it didn't look good on them. But when they do it with makeup artists, are you, are you saying, well, I was saying the reason why the girls are doing their own makeup is because they're probably the ones that are comfortable. And cause they're, let's be honest, Adam, okay. like I'm not trying to be mean, but there's some girls that, they need help. Okay. They, <laughs> I would tell them, I don't care. You need to book a makeup See, this artist. Is not my, this is not my arena. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think you're around a lot of girls that are really good at doing their makeup. Probably, yeah. If you look on Amazon on the makeup reviews and you see how normal people do your do their makeup, <laughs> you'll be like... Okay, you should get it. Pay for yeah. your pay for the makeup artist. Yeah, so practice. So okay. So I just want to put that disclaimer okay, out good. there. There, there are some that not. No offense, you might just be one of those girls that just don't even wear makeup on a day to day. Yeah, you know, so you're not used to it. So I mean, I I wear it all the time. Yeah, you're a, you're a makeup. Actually, she's a make. Uh, you're a makeup like hobbyist almost, right? Oh, I love it. Yeah, she loves uh, she loves it. When I used to stay at Ashley's house, you see, I mean, she her YouTube would be like makeup and fun stuff, and it was just like I'm like, you just watch this stuff. Like she's like, yeah, I love it. Like learn the new makeup tricks and whatnot. Just, yeah, you, that'd be a fun channel for you one day doing like makeup stuff or makeup tutorials. I mean, so. I'm not that. Good. I'm not makeup artist. Good. I feel like you're pretty good at it. I'm I'm okay doing my own face, but like. I don't know. I'm not claiming to be some extraordinary huh. makeup artist. Well, you know, Lindsay. So one, there's a there's a video floating around out there from years ago. Of Ashley did ha like half my face, like to to teach people how to do bikini makeup. We used to do crazy stuff. We used to do crazy stuff, and uh, um, it's funny as I've had a couple girls come up to me and they're like, "Hey, thanks for the makeup, <laughs> the makeup tutorial. I learned how to do my makeup for from you, which is really funny." You took but one for the team. There. I took one for the team. That felt so weird. And I can't do it. I can't do it. And then, but Lindsay said, Lindsay, who's a makeup artist said to, uh, to, to me, she was like, she actually does it like exactly how you should be doing it. So I was like, Oh, that's cool. So anyway, oh, good, good, nice. good, uh, tutorial. Well, maybe we'll put it in the description if I can find it. That, oh that video. yeah. So <laughs> going back to what you said, and I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. You said girls that do their own makeup, you don't see as much problem, but people that's gotten their makeup done before. Yeah. You run into, I would say it's not a high percentage, but 10, 15% where they just, they just end up doing their own makeup at the end anyway. 
Um, usually it's not the uh, eyeshadow. It's usually like the, the actual face, foundation. like the fo is a foundation. Okay, usually it's that. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's, you know, I, I just, I'm a fan of it just as a coach because the, getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning, do your makeup, 3.30 a.m., you know, it happens, you know, at these big shows especially, especially shows like USAs or Nationals where girls get backed up and they, they overbook and a girl shows up late and then that carries to the next girl and the next girl shows up late and then it carries to the next girl. And so you get backed up and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be done with my makeup. The, the girls are already getting on stage in A class. I'm C class. I'm back here still. And you're running to the front. It's like a whole nother stress. And they come back and they look a little watery because of the stress. And it's just, it's just a whole nother thing that I'd like to eliminate. With no pump. Yeah, with no pump. And uh, the cost, you know, it's just a cost thing too. If you're doing, you know, six shows a year, it really adds up. So these, yeah. these big shows can get really expensive with hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a, a two-day USA show, yeah, you're going to be in the $500 range. So if you could figure that out before then, then I know, right? It's, it's crazy. Yes. The, the girls at USAs really have it rough. I wish that was a one-day thing, but they're not going to switch it to a one-day thing. But because you're doing your hair and your makeup twice, you know, the guys, it's just like they just throw on their board shorts, like whatever. But it's a whole production, you know, for two days in a row. I really feel bad for the women who, who do USAs, and they, they know they're not top five, but they still put their hair and makeup the next day just to walk across the stage for 15 seconds. That's a rough one. Yeah, yeah that is rough. Jeez. Well, um, I think another important thing to consider before starting prep is do you have a plan? It's important to have a plan. Um, you don't need to know exactly what you're going to do every single day leading up to the show, but it's important to align yourself with an amazing coach like Coach Adam from Team Elite Physique.com. Um, <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, you have to have that figured out. Like who is doing your prep? Are they qualified? Are they good? Are they a good coach for you? Do they fit your style? Because some coaches, man, they're like more of the tough love coaches. Some of them are the um, cheerleader type coaches. So you got to find a style. And most importantly, you got to make sure they know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, not just some random bodybuilder dude from the gym, which is something we've run across as like yeah. a bodybuilder trying to do a bikini prep. It is not the same. <laughs> it is not. So, you know, I think it, it's very important to at least align yourself with the coach and also a good idea to roughly have an idea of maybe what show you might want to do just so you have something to aim for, right? Like, oh, there's this awesome show that takes place every year in my hometown and it looks really cool. I'd really like to do that. You know, having a show in mind, at least, I think keeps the motivation a lot higher than, oh, I'm going to prep for a show that's taking place sometime in 2023, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think you got a, a couple good points there. Um, find a coach who's had success in the division that you want to do. You know, that's the, that's the important thing. And as, as a coach's skill evolves, they'll kind of, they're, it almost like naturally selects them, right? Like, like it's funny as... I've had a few guys ask me about bikini. They're like, why do you kind of specialize in bikini? Now it's like bikini and wellness, you know? And they're like, why do you specialize in bikini? I'm like, I didn't choose bikini. Bikini chose me. Like, I didn't plan on it. Yeah, yeah Adam like, didn't like think like when he was first getting into it, like my dream is just to <laughs> be a bikini coach. Like, yeah. How did you get here? <laughs> yeah, it just it just works that way. I don't know. I just, it's its its own. What I The only, the, the thing I really like about bikini is I've always grown up kind of, I loved art. I always loved art and I loved, you know, photography and drawing and things like that. And bikini gives you a lot of artistic freedom that other divisions don't. It's very, very criteria based, the other divisions. And bikini has a lot of flexibility within your own artistic vision of what like that girl should look like, right? Because there's some softer, some harder, some fuller, some, you know, it's just, it's so different. You have the posing routine too, that has a big part of it. Like everything adds up, the hair, the makeup, all these little details. So that's why when you get a, like a bodybuilding coach who tries to do bikini, he just, he's trying to put her in a cookie cutter. No, she needs to look like this for bikini. And it's like, no, it's not, it's not how it works, man. It's like, you're so far from it that that's why you're, you're not successful. And so it's the, the guys who end up being specialists in that one, it's, it's, I don't know, it kind of picks you. And for me, it was, it was crazy. It's one of my first bikini preps, like one of my first bikini preps won like the hardest title to win in, in um, Colorado. And I was like, Oh, that was pretty easy. Like I, I've, to me, it was so obvious. And then that same show, and it was, you know, I was all, I had all men's physique guys, bodybuilders figure, and I had all these muscle divisions. And I started doing bikini because it came out, it came out a lot later. So um, when bikini came out and then we, we had um, shows in Colorado, because back then it wasn't like online. Everything was just getting started online and whatnot too. Bikini came out and I just dominated bikini. It was, you know, I do good in the other divisions, but I, 
dominated bikini. I didn't understand it. I was just like, oh, I guess I got really lucky with these girls, right? That I picked, the right girls came to me, I thought, right? And then there were six classes in bikini. We won four of them, my first attempt. And then we won Miss Colorado too. I was like, that's crazy. And then we won Miss Colorado again the next year. And then we won Miss Colorado again the next year. And I was like, okay, based on numbers, I think I'm good at bikini. <laughs> and, then, and then when you win those titles, especially locally, when everything was so local, you just get what you're winning, right? You just keep getting, if you win all bodybuilding, you keep getting bodybuilding. So then it kept getting more bikini and more bikini. And then you get better at bikini and then they get pro cards and they start going national. So you start getting better and better because all you're doing is bikini. And the next thing you know, you're bikini coach. <laughs> you're like, what happened? Next thing you know, <laughs> you're, you're cutting hair backstage. <laughs> you're being a pageant mom. You're looking at makeup and being like, oh, your eyebrows need to be darker. Yeah, it's so crazy what you learned. <laughs> Jeff Taylor told me he's, uh, cause I grew up all women, everything. I had, you know, single mom, household, a sister, even my dogs were girls. My aunt stayed with us, like lived on the, she lived on the couch with my mom. Right. And, and like, we, it was all women. And, uh, my, my, uh, Jeff Taylor goes, maybe he goes, cause he was trying to figure it out too. Cause I, I was a, I was a men's physique and like bodybuilder coach with, with him. Right. And then he was like, yeah, you're really all like a lot bikini now, right? And I was like, he was maybe, maybe you're good with women because of your upbringing and you were like a single mom and you're just like able to just be good with women. That's what you're used to. I was like, I never thought about that. I don't know what the reasoning of this is. It just happens, right? And it just, it just did. He's like, yeah, he goes, that has to be some part of it, right? You have to be like able to deal with maybe just you're always surrounded by them in your whole life and that's just how you function best. And so um, it's kind of funny because it does, it does pick you and you see it happen with a lot of coaches in different divisions too who are really good at, like they're good at bikini and men's physique, but then they're a little better at men's physique and then years later they're all men's physique team, right? You see it happen like all the time. So yeah, it does matter. Um, it's, unlikely, it's unlikely that I'm going to be prepping Mr. Olympia bodybuilder. I'm not gonna, that's probably not going to happen for me, right? Um, but it's also unlikely that the Mr. Olympia bodybuilder prep coach is going to be prepping Miss Olympia bikini, right? It's very rare you get those, mm -hmm. those um, transitions in those types of divisions. You might get some crossover in like the figure and the, you know, fitness because they're very close. Women's physique, those are all very muscular. Very, you get some crossover there. But in bikini, it's like its own thing. It's like its yeah. own art form, yeah. Definitely. I agree. I agree. Well, I'm glad that bikini has found you. Adam. I love bikini, man. I love yeah. it. It's the it's so fun. You know, it it's is so fun. fun. Yeah. It is. I I never really looked at it that way about it being like the more artsy kind of uh, aspect, but that is it's very true. There's more um, varieties, yeah. more ways you can prep someone or transform their look, and it doesn't necessarily have to fit into that cookie cutter like the other divisions seem to. Yeah, it, if you looking, you can look at it just in like a posing aspect, right? So with figure posing, very rigid, front, quarter turn, back, quarter turn, it has to be front. It has to be quarter turn. It has to be back, right? Bodybuilding, mandatory poses, right? Wellness gives you some freedom too. Dude, freedom. wellness has yeah. way more flamboyant routines than yeah. bikini. So you're going to have fun with wellness. I love wellness. Right? Yeah, wellness their, is great. Their posing routines is like bikini, but like twice as like, yeah. like, how do I say it? Showy? Yeah. Like. Ta-da, <laughs> Very sassy. Yeah. Very sassy. But with bikini, you know, you can have a girl with a wider waist, but you could still pose her in a way where you never see that, right? You hide, you, you have so much control of showing her best and hiding her weaknesses. And then you see that same girl backstage and you're like, that girl doesn't look like that, right? But you, you, you have that artistic freedom and figure you don't have it. It's like, open up. That's what my waist looks like. There's, you're not going to be able to quarter turn that. You know, you have to face the front. You have to face it. Everything is fully exposed. So bikini, that's why I like it. You have the art form of posing. You have the art form of hair. You know, your shoulders are too big. Let's hide them a little bit with the hair. Let's not open up so big. Your lats are a little small. You don't have any shape up top. Let's build your lats and let's open up, even though it looks like you're not opening up, right? Let's, let's, uh, let's make you look wider. Let's face you almost straight on because your waist is tiny. That's a great taper. Let's expose that, right? So all these different things. And it's just so fun because you really get to sculpt and right? you get to play, right? And it's like, it's just so fun. Um, in a lot of the divisions, you just don't have any of that, right? How are you going to hide a front double bicep and make a waistline look smaller on a front double? You know, like yeah. you're not much, there's not much you can do. True. So. <laughs> very true. Very true. Well, is there any other advice that you'd like to give anyone out there who is confused that uh, they're not ready or they are ready to step into contest prep from off season? Um, you know what? The best thing to do, honestly, the best thing to do is ask, you know, ask the coach. You can ask a coach in your area. You could always, you know, shoot me pictures too. I do that all the time, like daily. 
Um, and, and just say, you know, this is my height. This is my weight. Uh, this is the division I want to do. Should I be doing this right division for me? And, uh, you know, how far am I from a show if I wanted to compete? What do I need to work on? Because there is a lot, of, there is a lot that goes into it. And getting, an, uh, getting someone who's, you know, getting someone's opinion that has a good knowledge of it would be a good idea for you to really fill, fill it out. Because it's, it's hard to objectively look at yourself and say, say that because everyone gets prep goggles and, mm -hmm. and, and fit goggles, right? Uh, you know, I have, a, I have a pro bikini competitor I was telling you on my team and, and she was like, I just need to get bigger. And I'm like, you're- and it's not me because yes. I actually do. <laughs> I was like, you're big, you're like you're muscular. I've only had one feedback from you ever and it was unsolicited and Tarek said, hey, watch out for her shoulders getting too big. <laughs> like, and she still thinks she needed to get more size, right? So that's how bad we are at looking at ourselves, right? It's just- you get those competitor goggles, you know, and you just, you just think, you know, bigger is always better. And you know, there's a, there's a limit in bikini. That's the art form. Right. So yeah. So get that, get that objective eye and, uh, and there you go. Yeah. There you go. And there you have it. Well, thank you guys all for tuning in here today. I think that wraps up today's episode. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.